In a place called Bethany beyond the Jordan, Jesus was baptized by John. For centuries, the site of Christ's baptism, once celebrated as the birthplace of Christianity, remained a mystery. The Bible names it as the place where the Israelites crossed the Jordan River into the Promised Land, where Elijah ascended to heaven, and where John the Baptist preached. Generations of pilgrims once went there to walk in the footsteps of the patriarchs, to be baptized where Christ himself began his ministry in the waters of the Jordan. How did such a central event to Christianity become lost to history? And how was it finally found? Holy baptism is the basis of the whole Christian life. Was there a Bethany beyond the Jordan? There must have been because that's the name in the biblical text. But where is it? Bethany or al Machtas on the east bank of the Jordan River is one of eminent spiritual and historic importance. Yes, Your Majesty, I think I'm onto something big. He said, what? He said, well, you know, we think we've discovered where Jesus Christ, the Messiah, was baptized. I now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Baptism is the rite that all Christians of every sort agree must be accomplished in order to make one a Christian. Every human being is the icon of God, is the likeness of God, but the likeness has been soiled and it must be washed clean. The deepest and generic meaning of baptism is initiation. Initiation is required in the spiritual life because of our tendency to be worldly. You die for Christ, with Christ, and rise with him through symbol, and people are not the human is a symbolic creature, and we speak best only through symbol. And the church is full of ritual because it's this talking with God through signs and symbols. In a sacrament, there are two elements. There is an outward and visible sign, and then there is an inward and spiritual grace. So in baptism, Outwardly, water is being poured over the person, but inwardly, they are receiving the grace of Christ and the Holy Spirit. We die and rise again with Christ. So, coming up out of the waters, the newly baptized felt they were entering into new life. Before one can be baptized, you must first repent, and to repent means to turn around, turn away. And once you've been baptized, that you shall receive power, which is the Holy Ghost. Had it not been for the baptism, this important beginning, uh, there would not, not have been the earthly ministry of Jesus as we know it. And to me, that's why the site of the baptism is so important. Bethany is one of the holiest places of Christianity as it's the site where Jesus Christ was baptized and where John the Baptist preached. Of course, the baptism site is one of the three central sites in importance to Christianity because 
in the moment Christ is baptized, that's the beginning of Christianity, that's the beginning of Christ's mission. So along with his birth in Bethlehem and the end of his mission in Jerusalem, the beginning of his actual mission starts in the Jordan River. And this happened in Bethany behind uh, the Jordan River. So there was a, a Christian tradition locating that spot. But now the problem, where is Bethany? Across the Jordan. While one can assume the existence of a Bethany beyond the Jordan, it cannot be proven and is otherwise unknown. Unknown. Since the fourth century, many biblical scholars have been debating if a Bethany beyond the Jordan really existed. And if it did, were there any clues left to reveal its location? The modern history of Bethany beyond the Jordan began in 1897 when a scholar from Jerusalem traveled to the ancient town of Madaba and accidentally happened upon a mosaic map from the 6th century which had been covered under plaster for hundreds of years. Here we have a map of the Middle East. We have the Mediterranean Sea, the sea coast just uh, uh, west and here, at the edge, we have the desert. The center of the map is Jerusalem. You see, west and east of the river, there are some inscriptions. The first one is Betabara. Since the fourth century, the place of the baptism of Jesus was known as Betabara. East of the river, we have another inscription the spring, which is now Sap Safas. And from uh, literary sources of the 6th century, uh, we know that uh, this name, Sap Safas, was the name of uh, Lavra, a Byzantine monastery, visited by pilgrims to commemorate the baptism of Jesus. But why did the map use the name Bethabara instead of the original Bethany? The Christian tradition knew the place as Bethany until a church father came to the Holy Land seeking to identify the places named in the Bible. About the fourth century, a church father named Origen was uh, discussing where Jesus was baptized and he was unaware of any Bethany beyond the Jordan. And so he found in some biblical manuscripts the name Bethabara, which he interpreted to mean house of preparation. This seemed to fit the baptism of Jesus. So he took this name Bethabara and continued to popularize the view that it wasn't Bethany beyond the Jordan, it was Bethabara. Origen's understanding of the Hebrew word Bethabara was incorrect. Since Bethabara means house of the crossing and refers to the place where the river Jordan miraculously parted as Joshua led the Israelites into the promised land. If Bethabara was in fact associated with a different biblical event, where was the baptism site supposed to be located? The key phrase is Bethany beyond the Jordan. Beyond the Jordan is, is a phrase that would indicate it's not the Bethany of Jerusalem, but it's a different Bethany. It's a Bethany that is outside the land of Judea beyond the Jordan. So that key biblical phrase, which is preserved in the best uh, manuscripts, indicates that we should find Bethany to the east of the Jordan River rather than to the west side. So in reality, the map was wrong. It read Bethabara and not Bethany and placed it on the wrong side of the river. Yet it was accurate enough when used together with ancient pilgrims' accounts to lead explorers down to the area in 1899. They read these two places near the river, so they went back to the pilgrims, following them, I mean, where could be located, and they found. 
they saw some ruins, but because of the war, such evidence, archaeological evidence, was completely forgotten. Indeed, the Holy Land was shaken by two world wars and at least three major conflicts in 1948, 1967, and 1973. Rebounding from their initial shock, the Israelis unleash a savage counterattack as one of history's most violent tank battles is joined. As a natural boundary, the Jordan River area was subjected to endless upheaval. For much of the 20th century, archaeologists could not travel to the area where Bethany beyond the Jordan was suspected to be. So when I started working at Mount Nebo, I started asking to go there. Only in after uh, the peace treaty of 1994, in uh, 1995, I had the chance to speak with Prince Ghazi, and uh, Prince Ghazi said, if it's for that, after three days, we went down. An historic peace agreement between Jordan and Israel in 1994 gave Father Picciarillo the chance to finally explore the riverbanks to search for Bethany beyond the Jordan. He received help from Prince Ghazi bin Muhammad, the nephew of King Hussein of Jordan. It started in 1995. In 1995, I was the late King Hussein, my late uncle, so I was his cultural secretary. And I just happened to go to Mount Nebo. And I ran into Father Michel Picciolo. And he said to me, there's a spot that we know on the River Jordan. And this is where the baptism of Christ occurred. But we can't go there because it's mined and it's a military area. So I said to him, Father, listen, I can take you there. We, we'll coordinate with the army and they'll, they'll help us with the mines. So I said, okay, let's go. After a century of wars, a Hashemite prince and a Franciscan archaeologist followed the traces of those early pilgrims down to the banks of the Jordan River. What they found would eventually change the history of Christian archaeology. The first time I went to Prince Ghazi, I was myself, Prince Ghazi, and uh, Father Eugenio. They walked around and they started finding, just on the ground, in the open air, these massive mosaic patterns and what was clearly a church. Prince Ghazi was joking to me, saying, uh, Father Michele, it's better if you walk uh, ahead because you have the Holy Spirit with you because of the mines. <laughs> but there were more than mines in the area. After that first visit, an archaeological team was sent by Jordan's Department of Antiquities to carry out a dig and they met with local Bedouin tribes who knew the land intimately. كان في واحد اسمه صالح لي عقوب هون من العدوان بيحرث وبيفرح المنطقة. فسألنا يا شيخ صالح شو اللي عندك هون شو اللي فيه قال والله أنا هون إلي خمسين سنة وما شفت الشيء اللي ورجسوني إياها اللي هي الفسيفي سوى القطع يعني سنة العاشرة ولدي هذه مهي أرضنا ها زرع والله زرعت خمستعش سنة ما في ناس قال يا شباب في انتوا برايكم يعني تبعين حلال وتبعين كذا وبترعوا هنا وبترعوا هنا ودنا منطقه في منطقه فيها فخار هيك يعني قريب منكم هون هون قريب منكم قلنا والله في قريب منه هون والله ركبنا في السياره معاهم وطحنا I asked the local people and among them صالح اليعقوب what about this hell and he said this is tell mar elias nabi elias or elijah's hell the hilltop monastery they discovered was known as Elijah's Hill by locals and overlooked a green valley 
with seven springs leading down to the Jordan River. Elijah was a prophet of the 9th century BC, who according to the Bible ascended to heaven from this hill in a chariot of fire. The ancient pilgrims who came to Bethany beyond the Jordan mentioned in their accounts that Elijah's hill was one of the sacred places of pilgrimage near the site of Christ's baptism. Was there a connection between Elijah's hill and Safsafas? The archaeologists knew that if there was, the implications would be extraordinary. الفسيفساء موجودة في كل مكان يعني طلعت القصة وإلا هي معمودية كاملة متكاملة. We found the remains of three reservoirs, three pools, and these pools really dated back to the late Roman, early Byzantine period, and I think this is used for baptismal purposes. I was impressed by this water installation, installations which has to do with the conveyance, storage, and distribution of water. So the numerous pools, cisterns, reservoirs, well, and aqueducts, which indicates there were many monks and hermits living here. The vast water system and complex of buildings on Elijah's hill was a large monastery. According to Father Picciarillo's research, the monastery of Safsafas was founded in the 6th century in honor of John the Baptist by a wandering monk who had a vision of John on that very hill. There is a story of a monk uh, in a monastery in Jerusalem, so he decided to go to Sinai. He crossed the Jordan River, he became sick, and he entered the grotto, a cave. And during the night, he received a vision saying, stay here, because that's more important than the Mount Sinai. He said, why? I am John the Baptist, and this is the place where I met several times Jesus. So he accepted the, the vision. He remained there. He created a monastery, and uh, this is the monastery of Sap Safas, which is Bethany across the Jordan. The site itself has been indicated on the famous Madaba mosaic map. And the place is mentioned here in Greek. It has a Greek label mentioning Ainun. That is now Safsafa. And then there is a semicircular structure from which water flows, maybe sort of a fountain. And that is the fountain which is mentioned by the numerous pilgrims and travelers who visited the site. A sixth century pilgrim to the area said, there is a place to the east being about two bowshots from the river, where the prophet Elijah was taken up in a chariot of fire, and where John the Baptist had his cave. There is a cave there, and in fact there's many caves in this vicinity. Later tradition has monks coming to this area and staying in the place of John, fasting, praying, studying the Bible, preparing themselves as uh, John was preparing believers in his day. This is the western side of Elijah's hill. And we have here the cave where John the Baptist started his mission and preaching in the wilderness. And in the Byzantine period, they adopted this cave officially and they built a church in front of it. And we know that Jesus Christ had visited John the Baptist many times many times in his cave. Archaeologists had not only discovered Elijah's hill, they had also found the cave where tradition records Christ as having visited John. The monastery of Safsafas grew 
and eventually the entire valley was filled with monks who dwelt where John lived and preached. From the age of three or four, he lived by himself in this wilderness, just with a stick and with a, with a loincloth, and he was constantly, constantly, constantly thinking of God and constantly thinking of Christ. He preaches repentance so that then people will be in a receptive mood to hear the fuller teaching that Christ will be, bring. Well, John, of course, is that link uh, between the old and the new. Jesus said he's the greatest of all prophets that have ever lived. And he holds the tension of both. Uh, for example, he doesn't wear the right clothes. He isn't in the temple. He's off in this wilderness place. People that think like John the Baptist end up in these out-of-the-way places because there's no room for them in, in the central part of society or religion. John the Baptist was saying, in effect, to people, hey, clean up your act, behave righteously, and as a symbol of your intention to transform here is the demonstration. John the Baptist came there to prepare the road for Jesus. And the disciples asked Jesus that Malachi, he prophesied that Elijah will come back before Christ. Jesus told them that in fact he came back. And they understood that he was spoken about John the Baptist. The same spirit of Elijah was with John Baptist to prepare the, his people for the coming of Jesus Christ. John follows a way of life very similar to Elijah, dwelling in the desert as an ascetic. In the desert, all Trivial things are stripped away, masks are dropped, we become our true selves and we meet God. The people who come from the lower level are going to die. There are only the monastery. Explain to them. He says that uh, wilderness is the way of paradise of ma the monks. One of the countless souls who came to the same wilderness of John and Elijah was a prostitute of the 5th century. After her conversion in Jerusalem, Saint Mary the Egyptian went to Bethany beyond the Jordan and lived out the last 46 years of her life in solitude and repentance. The beautiful starting point of the story of Mary the Egyptian is she went from Alessandria to the Holy Sepulchre for the celebration of the Holy Cross. When she got to Jerusalem, uh, all the others entered into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. But when she came to the door, though the door was open, some invisible force prevented her from going through. And uh, she heard a voice. If you want to find peace, cross the Jordan River and live there. A monk named Zosimas was himself wandering the desert, searching for wisdom he had not yet found, when Mary appeared before him. They bowed to each other in deep respect and humility, whispering prayers of blessing. For me, what she represents is repentance, true repentance, and then making good on that repentance, patience and endurance. After this conversion she had, she lived on the site for 46 years. Not easy to live there, not easy to live there one day in summer. It's 46 degrees in the shade. 
It's wild. It's a wilderness. Shortly before her death, she met a priest monk, Zosimus, and she told him about her life. He returned and brought her Holy Communion, and then he found a little later when he came back that she had died. When Zosimus found St. Mary dead, he uh, hadn't the tools or the strength to uh, dig her grave, so a lion appeared from the wilderness and dug the grave for him. One of the things I always think when I go down there is, is so wild that we are now, we in Jordan, are living in the wilderness, what was referred to by the Bible as the wilderness. So I always chuckle to myself thinking that we are, we are from the wilderness. A tradition of pilgrimage developed in Bethany beyond the Jordan, commemorating not only the site of Christ's baptism, but the place where Elijah ascended to heaven and John the Baptist preached. But what did it mean for them to visit a place they believed to be sacred? What did they expect to find when they went there? Pilgrimage to a sacred site. You have to give up your time, you have to exert yourself. It can be very, very demanding. But in doing that, there is a spiritual feedback. God is present everywhere and fills all things. At the same time, there are certain places on earth where his presence is experienced with an especial power and immediacy. What we might call thin places, where the wall of partition between the visible and the invisible world grows transparent, points in sacred space. There are places in the universe that are very thin, and, and though they are material, when one is there, one senses that one is in the presence of something that is much, much more than just the material. Having been to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, having been to Bethlehem, the, the site of Jesus' birth, having been to the Jordan River, I can say that there is a sense of God's energy, God's grace that, that is focused in those places in a, in a particularly powerful way. Pilgrimages that we make in fact symbolize the fact that all our human life is a pilgrimage. It brings to our minds the fact that our true home is heaven. The written testimony of pilgrims was an important layer of evidence, which was used by archaeologists to bring them closer to identifying Bethany beyond the Jordan. The many pilgrims who visited the site in commemoration of Christ's baptism wrote careful and detailed descriptions of what they saw there. Is there a historical memory associated with the baptism site? Very possibly, because there were followers of John the Baptist who remained Baptist. So it's very likely that there was a population that stayed in the neighborhood where the baptism took place and where the Baptists had their center, who may have remembered where it was. The records of pilgrim travelers, pilgrim visitors, who, who went to the site of the baptism 
and they talk about going to a place on the east side of the river, the place where the Israelites would have crossed, a place where Elijah ascended. They talk about this as being the place of the baptism of Jesus on the east side of the river. When you read pilgrims of the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th century, the description of the places they gave in that time, now we find everything there. Now to exactly locate the place is a pilgrim, the pilgrim of Bordeaux, so in the 333. He went down to the Jordan River and he says the place where Jesus was baptized is five miles to the north of the Dead Sea. Exactly pointing where it was commemorated the baptism of Jesus. Interesting uh, visitor or traveler who visited the site in 530 is Theodosius. His account is quite interesting because he mentions that where the Lord was baptized beyond the Jordan, there is a little mountain from which the prophet Elijah was carried up uh, to uh, heaven. The last pilgrim we have was in the 14th century, Polonaire. Somebody told him there are ruins of the Christian sanctuaries across the Jordan. He says, I didn't cross the Jordan River for fear of the tribes. So from the 14th century, you must wait until uh, uh, the discovery of the Madabama. If Bethany beyond the Jordan was a destination for pilgrims celebrating Christ's baptism, and if the monastery at Safsafas was home to a thriving community, how could the site disappear completely from Christian history from the 14th century until the beginning of the 20th? What dangers could have kept the pilgrims away? During the Byzantine period, there was quite a bit of protection for Christians who wanted to travel to the holy sites. The church was strong in the Holy Land. All of that changed in 614 AD when the Persians conquered the Holy Land. The invasion by the Sasanian Persians made the area dangerous. But just a few years later, Muslims coming out of Arabia took over the Holy Land. During their rule, Christians were protected and could visit the east bank of the river unharmed. This area, what we call Jordan, was like an omen's land, accepted by both because of the pilgrims. A crusader prince broke the truce with the Muslims protecting the pilgrims, leading to the reconquest of Jerusalem by the famous Salahuddin in 1187. More crusades were launched from Europe, and the Holy Land was plagued by endless skirmishes and battles, making the area around the Jordan River dangerous and uncertain. As a result, people were reluctant to go to these biblical sites because of the physical dangers involved. Thereafter, the Eastern Bank would gradually become a wilderness once more, controlled only by local tribes and forgotten by the world. The upheavals throughout the centuries had proven too much for pilgrim visitors. So the sanctuaries faded from memory. The quiet history of pilgrims to the east went silent. But the discovery of the Madaba map in 1897 opened the way for Christians to begin slowly returning to Bethany beyond the Jordan. Salah Yaqub, who lived and farmed around Elijah's hill, remembers Christian visitors coming back to the area in the 1920s when it was still under Ottoman Turkish rule. Can you 
من يوم 20 25 واحنا هناك سكنين ونزور ونروح ونجي عليه وهذا يقولوا لك هذا يقول لك ودوا يا ابناء هانا كنيسه وفحرة الاساسات بس يوم صارت كسر التركية راحت صارت فوضى After another century of conflict, peace finally returned to the Holy Land in 1994, allowing archaeologists to make the historic discoveries of Elijah's Hill and John the Baptist's cave. But other sanctuaries, and perhaps the very site of Christ's baptism, still lay hidden somewhere on the banks of the Jordan River. نقب اول ما اول ما نزل نقب الدكتور محمد وهيب نقب على الكنيسه اللي فوقها اجيت انا والحجي الحجي حكى له قال له في كنيسه تحت على الميه على النار وي ريتش ذا بلايس ذير اون ذا ايسترن بانك اوف جوردن ريفر اند هي تول مي هير اي نو سم ريمينز ناو ديسابيرد ذا ريمينز ذا بيدوينز نو اباوت وير نوت ايزي تو جيت تو اند ان ذوز ايرلي دايز ذا اريا واز ستيل ا ميليتري زون and had not been totally cleared of landmines. Despite that incident, and the clear dangers of the site, the archaeologists persevered, searching for clues in the thick underbrush. As the team started digging down by the river, the remains of a large structure that seemed to be a church started to appear in the ground. This was obviously a dramatic breakthrough, but what church could this be? The Emperor Anastasius built a church a church dedicated to the memory of John the Baptizer. That church was east of the Jordan and at the site of the baptism. And we found remains of column, remains of scattered pottery shards, marble pavements, mosaics, caves of the hermits. And then they start to discover more and more things in the area. And they said, look, this is a major, major find. This is, this is something that goes back to the third century. This is St. John's church. Pilgrims' accounts reaching back 1,500 years described the sanctuary called the Church of John the Baptist, noting that it was near where Christ himself was baptized. The archeological team knew that they might have been on the brink of a discovery of fundamental importance, not just for archaeology, but for Christianity itself. So then I went back to my uncle, and he said, uh, so Ghazi, uh, any new projects? Literally, those are his words. So I said, yes, Your Majesty, I think I'm onto something big. He said, what? Well, you know, we think we've discovered where Jesus Christ, the Messiah, was baptized. The first church described here was in the year 530 by Theodosius, who said the following. He said, five miles north of the Dead Sea, there's the church of John the Baptist, and it's marked by a marble column on which there's an iron cross. 
Further excavations revealed an elaborate series of foundations dating from the 3rd century. In fact, what they found were the remains of five different churches built one after another on the same spot. The pilgrims' accounts describe the sanctuaries as being next to the river. So why were they making these discoveries on dry land, 500 meters from where the river was flowing? Now, the river isn't as big as it was 2,000 years ago. So the eastern bank has shrunk. Now the eastern bank is on dry land. We should always keep in mind the River Jordan has changed its course over the centuries. So it is maybe a little bit farther removed than it was in the 6th or early 7th uh, century. Uh, also, many earthquakes, powerful earthquakes, in fact, uh, hit the Jordan Valley. The river was passing just here, just to the west of these churches, and they, they caused the undermining of the foundations of these churches and their destruction. A sequence of churches are built there, they washed out and they were still rebuilt and continue to be rebuilt, meaning that somebody really thought that was the place. The early Christians built their churches in this spot where there's no community. And we should ask ourselves, why was this? Why did they insist to build their churches at this spot in particular? The reason is obvious. They wanted to mark something a clue to what the Christians were seeking to mark was a uniquely placed gate. According to Pilgrim's accounts of St. John's Church, there was a gate that opened to stairs leading down to the river. We have a gate that is built east of the Alps and that makes it something unique too because you never have churches Let's have a gate to the east, because the easternmost point of any church is its apse. I think it was Arthur who says, after staying a night at the monastery of John the Baptist, you walk down to the river. And then he says there are marble steps on both sides of the river which lead down to the water. And above the water there are stone bridge carried on uh, arches. At the end of those churches, as you go down the ramp and down the stairs, you come to a place where there are now left only these piers. Um, and those piers had the mother of all canopies over it. These are the steps that were described by Antoninus of Piacenta in the year 570, who said that marble steps lead you to the bank of the river where the Lord was baptized. We have discovered the remains of four piers, symmetrical with a staircase. What in essence we have is a gateway for pilgrims to come through, arriving at the center of these four piers. If you look at it in plan, it is a cross. So that makes it a unique cruciform baptismal font. Actually, it's the only cruciform baptismal font on earth that used the river Jordan to baptize in. That seems to have been the place where in the 3rd, 4th century, people really commemorated the baptism. But more than that, they went there to be baptized. And as they came out of the site, they drew these tiny little crosses on the plaster on the canopy. On this plaster, we have thousands and thousands of cross marks left by the pilgrims who were baptized at this point. The first level of evidence is the evidence of the Bible itself, very clear that it all happened on the East Bank. The second level is the archaeological evidence. The third level is the history and the tradition. And then the fourth level is the pilgrims' accounts, because we have very early pilgrims' accounts, pilgrims' accounts throughout the century, saying where exactly, X marks the spot, the baptism occurred. Epiphanius, for example, mentions 60,000 pilgrims 
holding candles at Epiphany here at this point. So in fact, all the five churches are connected to this point. And this is because that's the place that they believe Jesus was baptized. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens rent asunder and the Spirit as a dove descending upon him. The whole Old Testament and the whole New Testament are there together. There is no separation with Moses, Elijah, John the Baptist, Jesus, the disciples. It is one thing. Can I speak to people and say, this is where it happened? No, because who am I to say these things? Do I have any doubt? Am I certain that this is where it happens? I have no doubt, I'm certain. It's been exciting to follow uh, the excavation there and see that uh, uh, caves and churches and some foundations have been discovered in this site uh, exactly where I would have expected it to be. And uh, this is archaeological confirmation of the early Christian tradition and of the biblical text, which would identify this place as the place of the baptism of Jesus. We took this, these levels of letters to the churches. They all recognized it, the Catholics recognized it, the Orthodox, the Assyrians, the Copts, the Armenians, uh, all the different kinds, they recognized that this is one of the three holiest sites of Christianity. This is where the actual baptism occurred. Important representatives of the Anglican and Protestant churches have visited the site, in addition to the Roman Catholic, Eastern, and Oriental Orthodox churches. In 2004, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, the leader of the Anglican Communion, visited the baptism site. Other representatives and dignitaries from around the world have also come. Alexei II, Patriarch of all of Russia, stated, This bank of the Jordan River, blessed by the footsteps of our Lord, are as dear to us as the Grotto in Bethlehem and the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. We thank the Jordan Kingdom for this, giving us this piece of land. And uh, after that, we are going to start to construct a small chapel. For us, it's the biggest grace uh, to build church after 1,400 years to build a new Orthodox church in this area. On Monday, the 20th of March 2000, His Holiness, the Pope John Paul II, successor of Peter, returned for the first time in history to the place where Peter initially met Christ. We in Jordan are honored by our custodianship of this place and many other sites of religious significance. And it's our lasting duty to maintain these for the benefit of our people and for the benefit of the many visiting pilgrims and tourists from all over the world. Today the site in Jordan is overseen by a royal commission created by the late King Hussein and continued under King Abdullah II. It is visited by hundreds of thousands of people each year. The area is now a national park and is being maintained as it was found, a wilderness. The faithful 
has to think. Jesus, with his eyes, saw the same thing. He was here. He looked on the on the on the on the view and to see the, all these mountains. It is the same the same view. You see, then faith is not just only something you think you believe. Something you touch. <laughs>